Dear colleagues, dear guests, dear friends, welcome to this political discussion on improving care for alpha-1 patients. I'm honored to be able to virtually host this event, and I'm glad that Alpha-1 Global approached me with this request to mark in advance or in anticipation, if you will, of the 2021 European Alpha-1 Awareness Day. I want to congratulate Alpha-1 for what they are doing because the conditions has low awareness, even among healthcare professionals. These events are needed, especially now when so many political healthcare topics are being discussed. For this reason, I'm delighted to be able to do it now. I remember last year, we were not able to commemorate this day. I also wanted to welcome and thank my esteemed colleague, Marisa Matias for co-hosting this event. Today we have gathered a number of stakeholders and patients and we will speak about Alpha One in the context of upcoming policy revisions and of course not omitting the particular COVID-19 situation, a situation which is particularly affecting Alpha One patients. COVID-19 poses a public health risk to the EU population at large, but more particularly to vulnerable groups and especially to patients suffering from rare diseases with pre-existing respiratory conditions, such as alpha-1. Broadly speaking, we need to have European measures tackling rare diseases and particularly improving lives of vulnerable patients groups in times of pandemic. This was also highlighted by Commissioner Kyriakadis, who noted that we need to ensure that all rare disease patients in Europe have access to the right diagnosis and treatment they need. As especially in the first months of the pandemic, an estimated 84% of rare disease patients experienced some sort of disruption of their care. So today we are here to listen to you listen to experts and be able as politicians to keep Alpha One in political discussions and make sure that upcoming policy reflects the needs of patients. There is an upcoming revision of the cross-border healthcare directive and it is timely now to consolidate our perspective and make certain your views are reflected in this process and ultimately improve care for Alpha-1 patients. I was reading the Alpha-1 policy recommendations and discussing with Alpha-1 representatives, and I'm eager to hear more about how the European reference networks can be improved in the future. The IRNs are fantastic instruments created by the EU, but it is also true that there are some shortcomings which can be addressed. I'm interested in hear more about this form from Professor Krotowska. I hope I say your name correctly, who is speaking today later on. These are my short welcoming remarks. Welcome to all. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And now I will pass the floor to Mrs. Matthias. Marisa. Thank you so much, Isabel, and thank you, everyone, from this initiative. It's really a pleasure uh, being part uh, of this, and it is also a pleasure to co-host with this with my my dear colleague Isabel Wiesler Lima. Um, so uh, this is, as Isabel just said, this is a moment for us to listen you to to hear your demands uh, to know. Um, what should be our emphasis in terms of dealing with alpha-1 uh, disease and other rare diseases in the European Union, uh, and especially because you are, so, you, you are so acknowledged about all the situation, not only as patients, but also as family members and as experts and researchers, and this is quite important for our action. In these initial words, I just want to say that it's really Important that we discuss. Important that we discuss this in this moment because, as you know, health is at the core of the European intervention, as it is research and innovation, and uh, and we cannot uh, uh, you cannot forget that it's crucial for us to, to for us to have 
uh, uh, an approach, but an articulated approach and coherent approach on the rare diseases and on particular in alpha one. Uh, I know that uh, you are launching a call for action. I want to reinforce that I fully support the call for action that, uh, that you are trying to promote because it's really important that we develop at the European level, the European reference networks as is important for us also to uh, help and to define the legislations in order to improve diagnosis and to uh, have as a key objective the access for, to treatment uh, and also of course to as always to have an holistic approach. I will come back in the end of the session in any case now I just want to listen from you as my colleague Isabel said and uh, I want to tell you that the 25th of April is a wonderful date because it's a very important day for the Portuguese people and the, for Portugal as a country. So I think it's really great that we can uh, raise awareness concerning Alpha One at the same time that we celebrate democracy around Europe. So thank you so much. And I don't want to make a, a longer speech, so I'll pass the word to you, Adam. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Matthias, and a huge thank you to, to you and Ms. Bizarre Lima for your continuous support and engagement with the patient community. A welcome to everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Jordan Alexandrov, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to moderate today's event. I'm an associate director at RPP Group. We are a Brussels-based uh, healthcare consultancy, and we have had the chance to work and collaborate with Alpha One Global for the past several years. Please note that this event will be recorded and Alpha One Global will make this available to other patients and, and the public who are not able to attend. Today, we are joined by patients, clinicians, academia and industry representatives, and we have a number of presentations on our agenda. First, we'll hear from Alpha One Global, who will set the scene. Then we'll hear from Professor McElvaney, who will give an introduction about uh, Alpha One. After him, we welcome Professor Horostowska uh, Verminko, who will speak about Alpha One and the European Reference Network. Following her, there will be a presentation from Shane Fitch, uh, who is uh, an Alpha One parent, before hearing at the end the perspective of the European Commission and the upcoming revision of the cross border healthcare directive. Um, at the end of the event, uh, there will be time for questions and answers to be able to participate. Uh, in this section, please use the chat function or the Q&A box, which you see in front of you. Uh, type in the question you would like to be asked uh, and to whom. And please make sure to state your name and your organization before tabling your question. Then I'll be able to ask your question to, to the panelists. As Ms. Vizela Lima and Ms. Matias uh, underlined in their introductory remarks, today's event is about off one patients and what is politically needed to improve care for this patient community. With the European Commission constantly looking into how to improve the lives of rare disease patients, today there is an opportunity to elaborate more on this and other issues where EU's coordinating role can have an added value for our foreign patients. So our first presentation for today is from Randall, uh, who is a senior director of research programs at the Alpha One Global Foundation. Randa will outline the priorities of the international Alpha One patient community and make concrete suggestions on uh, particular considerations for Alpha One patients in the upcoming European policies. Randall, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Ms. Whistler, Lima, and Ms. Matias for hosting this event. We are honored that you've taken time out of your busy schedules to join us today. As Jordan mentioned, my name is Randall Plant. I'm the Alpha One Global Director for the Alpha One Foundation. Next. Alpha One Global is a program of the Alpha One Foundation. Alpha One Global's programmatic mission is to develop a collaborative global network of Alpha One patients, patient leaders, physicians, and researchers to increase awareness, detection, and access to care for alphas around the world. I'm pleased to say that we have representation from each of these stakeholders attending today's event, in addition to our government officials and industry partners. Alpha One Global's priorities include facilitating stakeholder collaboration, raising Alpha One awareness globally, and promoting early diagnosis and optimal access to care. Alpha One antitrypsin deficiency is an inherited condition that affects the lung or liver. 
alpha-1 patients are found worldwide, with the prevalence in Europe affecting about 1 in 1,500 to 3,500 individuals. The burden of alpha-1 can be significantly impacted by the delayed diagnosis and limited access to treatment. Early diagnosis is crucial for alpha-1 patients, but it is also a main difficulty in managing the disease. Most patients will not be diagnosed until symptoms have begun, despite the low cost and effective means of diagnosis, a blood test. Misdiagnosis prevents and deters the appropriate referrals to alpha-1 centers of excellence. For these reasons, it's imperative that we achieve a consolidated approach for patients, healthcare professionals, and government. Policies that facilitate sharing expertise and encouraging preventative measures, such as screening, will benefit all patients. Alpha-1 Global's priorities directly correlate to today's call to action. Our call to action was developed as an outcome from previous political discussions and building on the Alpha-1 European Expert Group Policy recommendations published in 2017. <clears throat> it is timely to do a call to action now, given that associated policies will be revised soon, as we hope that the Alpha-1 patient perspective will be considered when these revisions are performed. The first call to action is regarding European reference networks. As we know, ERNs aim to have specialized healthcare professionals collaborate to provide guidance on rare disease diagnosis and treatment. This places ERNs in a position to address some of the most important challenges faced by alpha-1 patients. It is therefore essential that ERNs function as efficiently as possible. In its special report, the European Court of Auditors concluded that European reference networks for rare diseases are an ambitious innovation, but their sustainability has not been demonstrated. Among other shortcomings, the ECA identified the absence of an effective system to assess ERN participants. In light of the upcoming revision to the cross-border healthcare directive, this call to action is that the European Commission should consider developing a project to generate minimum credentials for Alpha-1 centers of excellence. The second call to action relates to improving diagnosis. A lack of accurate and timely diagnosis is a major challenge for Alpha-1 patients due to a lack of awareness of the condition. Alpha-1 is excluded from systematic screening programs, even though it can be diagnosed through a simple blood test, as I mentioned earlier. Since Alpha-1 is an inherited condition, once one family member is diagnosed with, Al with Alpha-1, all family members should be tested for Alpha-1. However, family members may be hesitant to be tested because diagnosis triggers increased insurance premiums. The improving diagnosis call to action is that member states should consider developing an alpha-1 diagnosis program as part of a rare disease plan. The European Commission should update the 2002 CORTIS study and issue subsequent recommendation to member states. And finally, newborn screening for alpha-1 should be considered, recognizing the importance of avoiding expensive, untreated disease progression and expensive organ transplantation. The third call to action is extremely important. It is, a, it is access to treatment. Alpha-1 currently has no cure. However, the treatment for Alpha-1 is augmentation therapy, which aims to slow progression or prevent progression of lung disease. Despite this therapy success and proven cost effectiveness, it is reimbursed only in a few member states. That must change. Alphas need access to therapy. This call to action is member states should make augmentation therapy available and reimburse it for all patients. Member states should enact legislation that does not deter individuals from genetic testing by ensuring that non-symptomatic patients will not have higher insurance premiums. The final call to action is having a holistic approach. The improvement of care for alpha-1 patients should include a holistic approach, taking into consideration environmental issues such as pollution, both indoor and outdoor, and the toxicity of chemicals in employment settings. It is important because alpha-1 patients can develop worse symptoms in environments with air pollutants. We believe the European Commission should develop a comprehensive strategy on indoor air quality. EU member states should improve ambient air quality through effective implementation of the EU and World Health Organization developed air quality standards. Successful implementation of these call to action items requires broad support from various stakeholders, including EU institutions, national members, patients, and healthcare providers. We believe at Alpha One Global that together we can make a difference, enact these, these call to actions, and make lives better for alphas in Europe and around the world. In the US, during COVID, Alpha One Foundation has been able to bring together various stakeholders to minimize the risk alphas have faced during the pandemic. COVID has given us the opportunity in the US to better serve alphas 
by advocating for expanded coverage from government programs and services. Alpha-1 patients get infusions on a weekly basis and going to a doctor's office or hospital setting to receive treatment during COVID puts alphas at risk. The Alpha-1 Foundation was able to obtain emergency approval for patients on government programs to receive home infusions of the therapy. We were also able to expand government program telehealth coverage, again, minimizing the risk to alphas by not having to go to a doctor's office or hospital. There is a large appetite to continue and extend these government programs post COVID. This is very important because half of the US population relies on government programs for healthcare assistance. These are two examples of how patient care can be improved through collaborations and partnerships between patients, patient organizations, healthcare providers, industry, and government. Sunday, April 25th is Alpha One EU Awareness Day. We hope you can join us in celebrating this day by using the hashtag Alpha One Awareness Day on your social media channels. We will share the banner and hashtag after the event so you can share it on your social media channels to help us celebrate this important day. Finally, thank you. Thank you to our hosts, Mrs. Whistler Lima and Ms. Matias, for endorsing and co hosting this event. And we thank the attendees for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Randall, for this insightful presentation. Indeed, very valid points on, um, on the European reference networks. As you say, this was highlighted in the uh, Alpha One European Expert recommendations, which were published in 2017. And at least at, at European level for the past couple of years, um, the functioning of, of the European reference networks, as well as the functioning of the cross-border healthcare directive has been widely discussed. And I'm sure we'll hear more on the topic from Professor Horostowska and later on uh, from Mr. Dorazil from, from the European Commission. Our next speaker uh, is Professor Jerry McIlvaney from the University of Medicine and Health Sciences. Professor McIlvaney will briefly explain what is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and what are its particularities. Professor McIlvaney. Thank you very much, Jordan. And again, I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me here today. My name is Jerry McIlvaney. I'm Professor of Medicine in RCSI Medical School in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, next slide, please. So alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency was discovered relatively recently, just under 60 years ago, in Malmo in Sweden. And two very astute doctors noted that some people who had a lack of a protein in their blood had a, reason, a, a significantly increased risk for emphysema, even if they didn't smoke. And they characterized this protein, and they called it alpha-1 antitrypsin, and they found that people with low serum levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin were more prone to lung damage. And later, we found that it not only caused lung damage, it caused liver damage as well. Next slide, please. So basically, we have two diseases. We have a lung disease, and we have a liver disease. Next slide, please. If we look at these two together, looking first at the liver disease, we have what we call a gain of function. So in the classic form of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the mutant protein, which is called a Z or Z protein, gums up in the liver. It polymerizes in the liver and causes inflammation in the liver. But in addition to that, it fails to get out of the lung, uh, sorry, out of the liver and into the lung to protect the lung. So in the liver, you have a gain of function where there's too much of the abnormal alpha-1 antitrypsin causing inflammation, and in the lung, not enough of the normal alpha-1 antitrypsin to protect the lung. So you get liver and lung disease. Next slide, please. So what does that mean? What's the worst that could happen? Next slide. We well, get very severe lung disease. With severe alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you can get emphysema. So the body has major difficulty in getting oxygen from the air into the bloodstream. And this can lead to death and transplant or transplant. And in fact, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is one of the commonest causes of transplant worldwide. Next slide. You also can get liver disease. And this manifests itself sometimes as cirrhotic liver disease, cirrhosis, even if you don't drink that much. And there's a small but significantly increased risk for liver cancer. It can also manifest itself in children with jaundice at birth. And in a small percentage of these children, they require liver transplant in the first year of life. And finally, next slide, please. It can also manifest itself with a severe skin disease called paniculitis. This is a rare condition, 
but can cause death. Next slide, please. So our jo job is to prevent all these. So to put this in context, alpha-1 antitrypsin, next slide, please. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is a genetic disorder. The normal alpha-1 gene is the M gene. If you get an M from your father and an M from your mother, you're an MN. The classic deficiency forms of alpha-1 are the Z or Z gene or the S gene. So every person inherits two copies of a gene, one from the mother and one from the father. So let's look what happens when you have an MZ father and an MZ mother. Next slide, please. What you get are a one in four chance that each child will be a ZZ. That's the very severe form of deficiency. But a one in two chance that each child will be an MZ. Now for many years, we thought the only problem would manifest itself in people who are ZZ, those who had the alpha one gene from both parents. But we now realize that even the MZs or the SZs have an increased risk. Next slide, please. So we did this study in, in Ireland in conjunction with a group in Harvard. And we reduced referral bias in a special way. And we studied over 51 Irish families and 250 people. Next slide, please. And we showed unequivocally, next slide, that people who are MZs who smoked had significantly increased risk for COPD or emphysema. In fact, their risk was five to 10 times greater than an MM individual who smoked. And an MZ individual who smoked a little would have the same lung disease as an MM individual, a healthy control individual who smoked a lot. So this is the first time we ever found that MZs, whom we had referred to as carriers in the past, had a significantly increased risk for COPD. But we also knew, and I think it's been referred to before, that we are grossly underestimating the number of MZs in the population and only picking up a small number. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. What about SZs? This is another form of alpha and antitrypsin deficiency. And again, working with our colleagues in Harvard, we looked at 44 Irish families and 166 people who participated in the study over three years. And we looked again at their breathing tests. Next slide, please. And we found that SCs have an increased risk for COPD, similar to MZs, but only if they smoke. So this is an important point. MZs and SCs who don't smoke have no increased risk for COPD or emphysema. Again, reiterating the need to stop people from smoking. And we find that people with alpha one antitrypsin deficiency who are told to have the problem and are told to stop smoking usually do. Next slide, please. So we showed in a follow-up registry that the SCs had a moderate deficiency, but if, if, if they smoke, they have an increased risk. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so in this slide, you can see these are people who didn't smoke. There's no difference between the SCs and their MM counterparts. Their siblings. So people who don't smoke have no increased risk for lung disease. Next slide, please. But when we look at SCs who smoke, and they're in the orange line here, compared to the greens who are MNs who smoke, there's a significantly increased risk for SCs. So SCs who smoke have an increased risk for COPD. MZs who smoke have an increased risk. ZZs who smoke have a phenomenally increased risk if they smoke. But unfortunately, ZZs, even if they don't smoke, can get emphysema and COPD. Next slide, please. So here's the risk. A ZZ has severe deficiency. A significantly increased risk of lung disease, both in smokers and non-smokers. And an increased risk for liver disease. SCs, significantly increased risk of lung disease in smokers and an increased risk of liver disease but no increased risk for lung disease in non-smokers or never smokers. MZs, significantly increased risk of lung disease in smokers, but not in never smokers, but an increased risk for liver disease. So over the last number of years, we have worked out who's at most risk. But the problem is we're not diagnosing people in sufficient numbers. Next slide, please. So here's what we think is a typical alpha one. It's usually a male, usually in, in their 50s, 
an ex-smoker. They've smoked about 20 cigarettes a day for 20 years. Their lung function is down about 63% of what it should be. Their CAT scan shows emphysema, bronchiectasis. They have abnormal liver function tests. The liver ultrasound will show a fatty liver. And here's the kicker. They're diagnosed at age 45. And there's a big delay in diagnosis, as much as nine years from the time they had symptoms. And it's reckoned in the US, it takes five doctors seven years to make the diagnosis. Now that's what we think, but reality is somewhat different. Next slide, please. Because a typical alpha one could be that child there who presents with jaundice at birth, about 10% of ZZs present with jaundice at birth. In the majority, it clears up, but a, a small percentage that need liver transplant. Next slide, please. Or these individuals here, all presenting with liver or lung disease at different times in their lives. Next slide, please. So how common is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? We did a study in Ireland using a DNA database and we found that in the Republic of Ireland alone, a small country of less than 5 million people, there's 170, 171,000 MZs, about 2,000 ZZs, and about 10,000 SCs. Next slide, please. Next slide. And if we look to Ireland, both north and south, in the Republic and Northern Ireland, 250,000 MZ, 250, MZs, 12,000 SCs, 3,000 ZZs. In fact, the carrier rate for the Z gene in Ireland is one in 25, which is very, very common. Something we had totally underestimated in the past. Next slide, please. So who do we test? How do we increase our ability to detect people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Well, the World Health Organization and the ATS and ERS produced these statements. And what they said was, next slide, please, that we should test certain groups. All people with COPD, next slide please. All non-responsive asthmatics, next slide. All people with cryptogenic liver disease, next slide please. And all patients with paniculitis. And all first degree relatives of patients or carriers with alpha-1 deficiency. So we should test these people irrespective of what, what else they have. And so that led us in Ireland to set up a targeted detection program. Next slide please. And we set up a target detection program whereby if you have COPD, COPD or poorly responsive asthma or if you have cryptogenic cirrhosis or indeed if you're a first degree relative of a person with alpha-1 or had paniculitis, we would test you for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And this is funded by our government. And we also set up a system whereby if your levels of alpha-1 were low, we would test you for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Next slide, please. And we've screened over 20,000 people to date. We receive approximately 150 samples per month. Next slide, please. And what we have found is most of our referrals are from people with COPD, but a significant number have liver disease, some have asthma, and some have reduced alpha-1 antitrypsin levels, quite a number of a family history. So over 20,000. Next slide, please. What have we found? We've detected almost 4,000 MZs nearly 400 ZZs and around 400 SCs. So about 30% of the people we test have an abnormal gene. So this tells us an awful lot. This is the type of program, a targeted detection program, which would be very beneficial throughout Europe. Next slide, please. There's something else we've found. Not only do your parents give you their genes, they give you their smoking habits. If your parents are smokers, there's a significantly odds ratio of the children being smokers as well. Next slide, please. So it's a double whammy, a double hit. You have an increased genetic risk and you have an increased social risk. Next slide, please. And it's not just a double hit. We've mentioned earlier about the problem with pollution. And we found that people, even with the MZ form of alpha-1 who smoke, have increased risk if they're exposed to vapors, dusts, gases, or fumes, both inside and outside in their work. So again, it's a triple hit. Next slide, please. We haven't mentioned much about liver disease. We're still learning about the liver disease associated with alpha-1, but we know if you've got a fatty liver or if you drink a lot of alcohol and you have alpha-1 antitrypsin sufficiency, MZ, SC, or ZZ, you're going to have an increased risk for liver disease. Next slide, please. Are there specific treatments? Randall has mentioned augmentation therapy. 
widely available in the US and some parts of Europe, but not all parts of Europe, including my own country. Purified by the, sorry, uh, licensed by the FDA in 1987. Next slide, please. And a rapid trial was carried out in the US and in Europe in 2015 showed definitively that plasma purified alpha-1 antitrypsin can slow down progression of emphysema in people with severe deficiency of alpha-1. Next slide, please. And here's the data. You can see the blue line is people receiving plasma purified alpha-1 antitrypsin. That is alpha-1 purified from the bloods of MM individuals. And then the red line is people receiving placebo. And within two years, there's a 33% reduction of progression of emphysema in people receiving treatment. And then at the end of the two years, those who received placebo were placed on the therapy, and again, the rate of decline significantly decreased. Next slide, please. So that's one treatment. There are others, potential ones. There are oral elastase inhibitors, which can replace the alpha-1 antitrypsin in the lung and prevent the progression of lung disease. Next slide, please. And then there's specific therapies aimed at the liver, where we can knock out the Z gene in the liver. And then new therapies aimed at unfolding the alpha-1 antitrypsin in the liver, getting it out of the liver and into the lung, hitting both parts of the disease at one go. So there's lots of treatments on the horizon for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. We just have to get our patients access to them. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, alpha-1 antitrypsin is the prototype COPD biomarker. It's easy to measure. The lower the level, the greater the risk. Next slide, please. You have to test for it, though. It's no use thinking about COPD and not testing for alpha-1. Next slide, please. What do we do if we get a diagnosis of alpha-1? We stop people smoking. We're very good at that. We look at their environment. Can we change that? Next slide, please. We screen their family and pick up people early before disease uh, exerts a terrible influence on them. Next slide, please. We, we have genetic counselling. We tell people what the risks are for lung disease and liver disease based on our knowledge. Next slide. We rehab them in pulmonary rehab. Very important in people with COPD. Next slide, please. We assess their liver in addition to their lungs. We see what the risks are for liver disease. Have they got a second hit? Are they drinking too much? Are they overweight? That sort of thing. Can we intervene? Next slide, please. We get those patients to a specific designated specialist alpha-1 clinic. And we have set that up in Dublin and others are following our example. And next slide, please. We get them involved in clinical trials because these clinical trials are long lasting. They take a long time, but if they're effective, we want our patients on them early. We want access to trials and we want access to effective drugs, as Randall has mentioned. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Gurmila Mahagov, we, I really appreciate the opportunity of talking to you here today, and hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions you might have in the question and answer session at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Michael Vaney. Um, and in the meantime, I saw that uh, Ms. Roberta Metzola from the European People's Party from Malta has joined us. Ms. Metzola, we are uh, we are very glad to have you with us. Um, and now just uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor uh, Joanna Hrostovska Vominko, who is the lead of the Cross-Border Care Committee of the European Reference Network for Lung, the ERN Lung. Uh, Professor Hrostovska is uh, also the coordinator of the Central uh, Eastern European Alpha 1 Network and a coordinator of the National Alpha 1 Antitrypsin Deficiency Registry. Professor Hrostovska Vominko. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. I'm, I'm really happy and proud to be here with you. Um, as a representative of um, healthcare professionals who uh, work and uh, help Alpha-1 patients, uh, Professor Michael Vani provided you with a very comprehensive overview uh, of what Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is. Now, he also, I think, very uh, nicely shown that uh, we have the knowledge and expertise how to um, uh, effectively uh, provide the genetic diagnostic, the clinical diagnostic and treat treatment to alphas uh, in Europe. 
So now the question is how to make sure that the um, uh, healthcare provision in Europe is equal in terms of the um, uh, merit, uh, the expertise, but also access to both diagnostic and treatment. And next slide, please. And that has been an uh, issue uh, uh, in Europe um, for some time. And roughly at the same time when um, the, the rare diseases networks have been uh, brought to, to life by European Union, uh, European experts, uh, Jerry and me included, have published the um, the guidelines, the call for action, as, as you can see, we mentioned that in order to uh, ensure that all alpha-1 patients are cared for in a holistic way, uh, we need support uh, from European Union, but also we need support from national governments. We called for a coordinated EU policy uh, to harmonize standards, uh, and benefit uh, patients from differential expertise. And indeed, uh, next slide, please. The, uh, the networks, the networks uh, uh, of European reference centers provided that kind of expertise and excellence. So, um, what is really important, in my opinion, in the uh, idea of European reference networks, and I am very happy to work within the uh, ERN lung network dedicated to rare uh, diseases of respiratory tract, is that the networks um, are able and do share not only the professional expertise, the medical expertise, but we also uh, are very dedicated to providing, um, uh, providing the proper um, medical expertise to patients. And importantly, I think it needs to be emphasized also to educate our colleagues and also help patients to educate the society about the rare diseases and in this case about alpha-1. Next slide, please. So, um, as I mentioned, I am part of the uh, ERN Lung uh, Steering Committee, and within this network uh, dedicated to the respiratory system, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency core group is one of the distinct part, uh, part of this, uh, parts of this network. Next slide, please. Um, so this uh, picture represents uh, the, uh, the network, Alpha One network. Uh, and here comes the, the, the first issue I would like to address. I mentioned that what we need really is the network of specialized dedicated centers that would be able to provide both expert diagnostic and treatment to the patients. Um, the um, the, the um, ERN structure um, includes, per definition, uh, so-called core members or full members, so the, the centers that are both fully qualified to serve as a highly specialized centers, but at the same time are endorsed by local governments. So as you might see, uh, we here in within the structure of Alpha One um, network, we have both full member, core members, but also affiliated partners. So those partners uh, are actually the new category that we have to create because those centers, although fully expert and uh, um, able to uh, provide highest expertise for some reasons, sometimes administrative reasons were not endorsed. Uh, and we very much wanted to include them into the network. And secondly, you also see the supporting partners. So those are centers that are, are not fully qualified as expert centers. But having said that, I think this is a very important message for the future. We should also open the networks for the centers who really intend or aim to uh, become an expert or have to um, gain uh, some expertise in order to provide the service for the, uh, for the region, for the country. And therefore, in that aspect, the, uh, uh, definitely the definition of um, 
of um, a network member should be a bit modified. Nevertheless, as you can see, we were able to, um, uh, to uh, build quite an impressive network within Europe, although there is definitely a need to, uh, for the growth, the need to extend this network to, uh, uh, to other, to some regions, to more countries. Next slide, please. And just very shortly, what we considered as the main aims of our core uh, Alpha One group. First, of course, uh, it was a growth. Uh, it was uh, to really make sure that all the countries or uh, major regions of Europe are being represented. And we did, uh, with the, the, for the, this, uh, let's say, new definition of supporting partners or contact point centers uh, and our priority uh, definitely was uh, uh, not only uh, Western European countries with a good history, uh, impressive history of um, Alpha One research and activity, but also those countries within Europe that are um, relatively new uh, to Alpha One field. Next slide, please. So growing of the group, but also uh, providing the highly specialized healthcare for up one uh, patients in Europe. For that, of course, the cross-border clinical cooperation is absolutely fundamental. As you have seen from the map I provided, there are regions and regions and countries in Europe where um, there is not a specialized uh, care for up one patients. Hence, the importance of cross-border clinical cooperation. Next slide, please. For that, uh, ERN uh, lung is actually ideal setting. This is, uh, the, this is the structure that has been, as I said, born in order to, to provide the expertise, trans-border expertise, and, it, 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 and indeed, it's, it's really, really helpful. So we have developed the online Exabo system. This is the expert advisory board. This is the, um, the online system and improved, it proved very efficient during the COVID times that serves both healthcare professionals and importantly patients. This is the system that provides both education and information and is shaped for both groups. Next slide, please. Uh, but also we, within the, the ERN networks, we uh, use the clinical patient management system. This is uh, a system defined more for a healthcare professional, for, uh, for the specialized, specialized care. And it was designed to enable live, live discussions of clinical cases. And it really proved very efficient, but only within the network. So the, the, the unmet need, as I called it, is that CPMS is open only to those centers who are part of the network. Uh, therefore, it allows us uh, to communicate only within the centers that are part of your lung, whether we do believe that it would be very helpful to open it to the um, interested specialized respiratory, in this case, centers, uh, who would be able to share and discuss with us the difficult, uh, difficult uh, clinical um, problems. Next slide, please. Um, also, we developed a def um, defined algorithm for cross-border care. As you might uh, imagine, this is quite a complicated um, um, problem uh, involving not only clinical matters, but also legal matters and matters um, related to the local um, national regulations regarding the reimbursement of care. And also there is a certain specificity of alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, which actually is helpful in this regard that uh, with this um, algorithm, we are able to help um, uh, those countries, those centers uh, that do not have access to diagnostics, uh, to genetic diagnostics, because unfortunately, this is a reality of a uh, um, number of countries uh, within European Union. So we can at the first level provide them with help in terms of actually 
confirming the genetic diagnostics, the diagnosis of alpha-1, and then consequently, uh, if necessary, also provide clinical expertise. And optimally, at the stage three, we would love to also provide um, access to treatment. And I think this is the most difficult part. It has been addressed by previous speaker, and this is, I think, something for the future that definitely needs our action. Next slide, please. So uh, yes, and next and next. So those are the, the bullet points I wanted to emphasize. Then in terms of um, another aspect of highly specialized, specialized healthcare, I also, um, I have already mentioned that uh, unfortunately number of countries within Europe do not have access to um, genetic diagnostics, but also we have noticed at the very beginning that we do not have a reliable system that uh, would ensure the high standards, so-called um, quality uh, quality control system. And this is something that we decided to build within the um, uh, Alpha One core group. Also in terms of harmonize, harmonizing the diagnostic procedures. And we have built, uh, we started to build the network of certified laboratories within the Alpha One core group. Next slide, please. And um, so, and, and next. So the two core labs are uh, Warsaw and Pavia. And next slide, please. And what we do, we actually share the samples uh, twice a year with other European laboratories. And next slide, please. Just to ensure the harmonization and the highest quality of diagnostic, uh, uh, genetic diagnostic. Next slide, please. I think this is very important because that way we not only ensure the, uh, the, the, the good standards, the high standards of diagnostics, but also hopefully uh, with the uh, cross care um, uh, collaboration, clinical standards of clinical care. And then finally, uh, we do collaborate in, in a very intense way with the um, Clinical Research Collaboration Network, ERCO. This is the network dedicated to science. To, um, uh, to actually addressing the scientific goals. And in that regard, we jointly build the uh, longitudinal European Alpha, Alpha One registry. This is very important, not only in terms of the clinical care, as you might imagine, but also addressing the issues of the natural history of disease comparing the, the data between, uh, between European countries, but also ensuring the harmonization of the clinical care. Uh, in that aspect, uh, I think ERN LANC is actually the ideal setup for uh, joining the uh, scientific knowledge and scientific project with the highest standards of clinical care. That's a one pillar. The second pillar, uh, in my opinion, is harmonization of the standards, as I mentioned, um, um, making sure the access to uh, highest quality healthcare provision uh, in Europe becomes uniform. And the third pillar, very important, is the uh, education, education of healthcare professional. Uh, awareness, it has been mentioned, is not, um, not ideal as yet. And next slide, please. But above all, uh, for ER and lung, uh, it's very important. What is very important is the very strong involvement of patients. I am really happy to say that patients are present in the, in the leadership of Alpha One uh, core group. Patients take part also of ERCO. And I think this model is actually the, the optimal to provide, to, to uh, meet the goals we set up for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gorostowska, for this um, quite, quite interesting presentation. I'm certain that you'll be able to elaborate further on this during the open floor discussion. Um, our next speaker is uh, Shane Fitch from, uh, who is, uh, Shane Fitch is an Alpha One parent. She is the CEO of Lovex Air Foundation and she'll be speaking about what does it mean to live with uh, Afwan. Shane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, could we pass to the slide, uh, the next slide, thank you. Um, my, 
Thank you very much for inviting me today and for these wonderful presentations. It's great to be a part of this. Well, my son was born with alpha-1 22 years ago with cholestasis, which is a liver condition indicating that all was not functioning as normal. At that time, it was a life-threatening situation and a painful and emotional start to life, where, which consisted of lengthy procedures in hospitals including a surgical intervention that in itself put his life at risk just to ensure that alpha-1 was in fact the cause of his liver disease and to confirm his diagnosis. So from the early days, we took his health seriously and connected with specialists in Spain and other countries through a small growing global community of patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals and researchers, a network of dedicated people. So I made it my life's work as a parent and professionally to get involved in alpha-1 patient advocacy on many levels to determine how we could actually do better for each person living with this rare disease. That meant learning from the very many personal difficulties people face across the world from delayed diagnosis, as Dr. McIlvenny said, seven years on average, its impact on their lives, the limited care support, or the healthcare professional's knowledge, to their struggle to access augmentation therapy in specific countries, or how they actually deal with the complexity of transport, transplants just to keep on living. The rare disease movement in the early days promoted patients' right to access clinical healthcare centers and, this, and centers of excellence, which fortunately, uh, we are managing to preserve in current times. Awareness, education about alpha-1 can guide better care practice and attention amongst healthcare professionals, as well as research, working hand in hand with patient communities, as Dr. Jorostoska has mentioned. But now we need not only to sustain these networks, but adapt and improve them in the digital area, where citizen empowerment is a key driver in a changing society. During these past 22 years, I have met alphas across the globe, listened to their stories, and often sadly have lost my mentors, friends, and colleagues along the way. So many people struggling to adapt their lives, come to terms with their condition, and even understand without genetic counseling what alpha one means. Having to leave their jobs, lose their social life, suffer failed marriages or relationships, drop out of leisure or physical activities, and somehow begin their own rare disease journey. How do they manage? Often with limited care plans, little or no access to pulmonary rehab or respiratory physiotherapy, and for many are still unable to access augmentation therapy, or simply resign themselves to just stay connected to their oxygen all day long in sedentary and isolated lifestyles. Has much changed from the patient perspective? No. As demonstrated by the AARCO study published in 2020, which clearly shows that the priorities for patients remain the same as 22 years ago. Next slide, please. And now the next. The challenges. Well, these have been addressed by all of us today. And we know that the world has changed. A pandemic has highlighted just how many of these issues can be fixed, some more simply than others. Though our new generation of alphas is still confronted by a similarly challenging scenario from 20 years ago. So how do we now address this? How do we find the alphas? We are not overcoming the barrier to ident identify alphas and their families in sufficient numbers to prevent potential disease onset and encourage lifestyle change and healthy behavior for those people who are at risk. So how can we go about it? There are choices. As mentioned before, we could opt for the newborn screening, or perhaps we could take a public policy approach to healthy lungs. AAT serum tests for alpha-1 levels in children aged one to two years when lungs are in early development. 
could become part of a broader public health policy, along with the vaccine schedules in primary pediatric care. This action would enable us to engage people in the early years and provide appropriate preventative guidance to parents and the right sort of education in order for children's lungs to stay healthy in general, not just for alpha-1, but also to reduce serious infections, vi virus and NCDs, or exposure to the airborne contaminants, including tobacco smoking, pneumonias, bronchitis, asthma, and so on. So prevention for all people on how to keep healthy lungs is beneficial and is actually now imperative in our society as highlighted by a pandemic, by climatic change, and by the Breathe Vision 2030 initiative. If there is an alpha issue, it can also be dealt with early on. Next slide, please. And the next. This diagram helps us to see how we can structure our connectivity in an ecosystem, a digitally interoperable environment. Diagnostic test kits delivered to our door, home care and online patient management, supported including pulmonary rehab or virtual reality. Guidance is available without overusing our hospitals or primary care in face-to-face -face exchange. Dedicated teams can work with us on support at scheduled times and in a convenient manner. Home-based infusion therapy for augmentation treatment has been practiced for 20 years in the USA. And it's beginning to take place in some European countries with experienced alpha advocates or practiced in communities with trained healthcare therapists. E-monitoring our patients to check on their well-being, act to prevent worsening healthcare, unnecessary hospitalizations, prevention in ex exacerbations, can also be managed by a telehealth interface and platforms which track patients' progress in their care plans. We can get our medication reviewed or support better sy symptom management, and together with innovative engagement tools, even personal virtual assistants can improve our self-care techniques. And we can actually do this, ensuring that we work together in secure GDPR compliance systems. The information and data shared securely through digital platforms, interoperable EHRs and registries such as the ERN is now vital for developing a real time knowledge about the implications of a disease which goes far beyond the lungs and the liver, enabling us to provide effective and efficient treatment and care pathways for patients, guarantee supply and safety in plasma therapies, grow registries dynamically by active use of participation, not just healthcare professionals, but patients, families, and caregivers. We can capture a broader view on alpha-1, the natural history, including beyond the liver lung manifestations. We can research in, into innovative therapies. We can improve training and education for a wider community, healthcare professionals and patients. And we can innovate in diagnostics, care delivery, therapeutics, or devices. Can we pass on to the next slide? So applying AI or relevant data science analytics to reliable and diverse data sets to calculate probabilities in predisposition to disease development, apply prevention or prediction related to disease progression and optimize our personalized care and treatment are really just around the corner. This will in fact drive affordable, accessible, and sustainable care solutions when we achieve scalable deployment across frontiers. Shared ecosystems will enable Europeans to access these resources more equitably. So important for rare diseases because of our as yet dispersed and relatively small number of patients and expert clinical centers. The e-clinics will act as hubs together with patient communities and connect people where and when it matters. Now is our opportunity to work together with all our stakeholders as we have been diligently doing over the last two decades and embolden a Breathe Vision 2030 initiative with a call to action 
to make the change for alphas and rare diseases happen for the next generation. So let's work together to make treatment and care holistically available across borders in all our European countries, holding the same quality standards to fulfill the European directive on equal rights for its citizens in quality of care, safety, protection, health, and well-being. It's time to make a difference to people's lives and show from the Alpha community just how this can be done effectively. Last slide, please. Finally, I'd like to personally pay a tribute to John Walsh, Alpha friend, mentor, and colleague, who for many years held the flag for the Alpha community worldwide from the Alpha One Foundation. He showed us the way through innovation, courage, and determination, and so many of us are grateful for his leadership. We are continuing on this same path. So I'd like to thank you today for the opportunity to share my experience on behalf of European Alphas, whose voices I have listened to and experiences I continue to witness over these many years. And also to my son, Aaron Strong, a young 22 year old said, said Alpha, a professional surfer who inspires younger generations and myself by his own example in overcoming his health issues to live his dreams no matter what. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shane. It's, it's really amazing to see how, uh, or to see what you have been, what you have achieved for, for the past several years. And I just wanted to congratulate you for, for this. And now I would like to, to give the floor to uh, Mr. Martin Dorozil from the European Commission. Mr. Dorozil is a deputy, the deputy head of unit of the Digital Health European Reference Network section of DG Santé. And Mr. Dorozil will provide a short update on the European Reference Networks, especially in the context of uh, the evaluation of the cross-border healthcare directive. Uh, Mr. Dorozil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity. It's, it's, it's my pleasure to be with you today and uh, contribute to this very, um, very important uh, and interesting event. Uh, so in my presentation, I will uh, provide you with um, the information on, on the European reference networks, the latest uh, developments, uh, the achievements that the system uh, has reached so far and, and some you know, future actions or, or, or the next steps that we, we plan to do in this, this era. Next slide, please. So I will start uh, with a general uh, um, kind of background of, uh, of, of the European Reference Networks, what they actually are and what do they do. Uh, so the, the European Reference Networks are voluntary uh, networks of uh, highly specialized centers uh, dealing with rare or low prevalence uh, complex diseases. And uh, they uh, are uh, helping um, the patients uh, with rare diseases, but also uh, they're treating uh, health professionals through different ways. I mean, the, their primary area of activity is, is clinical. So uh, they are organizing virtual remote uh, consultations uh, using uh, dedicated uh, uh, teleconferencing tools and uh, they discuss uh, uh, individual uh, patient cases and exchange uh, clinical data uh, in order to provide the right uh, diagnosis and uh, the right treatment uh, to, to patients that, that they need. But uh, the cooperation goes also you know, beyond this, this clinical activity. They, uh, the, the European Defense Network should also be focal points for knowledge generation uh, and uh, training uh, and learning activities uh, related to rare diseases. Um, they should also um, facilitate the collaboration on, on various research projects um, on rare diseases. And um, for example, also to the development of uh, clinical uh, practice guidelines. Um, the underlying uh, principle of these networks is that for, for rare diseases, uh, it is very difficult for individual member states uh, to have uh, all the expertise they, they need due to the rarity of, the, of those conditions and, and, and the expertise being you know, scattered in, in, in different centers. 
so uh, these networks are um, uh, trying to pool uh, the expertise and, and knowledge and uh, make it uh, available uh, for the large disease community. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the, uh, with regard to the, to the formal you know, framework that we have for, for, for the European Health Networks, they are based on uh, the directive on uh, patients' rights in cross-border healthcare that was adopted uh, 10 years ago in 2011. And uh, this directive currently is undergoing an evaluation. So it is being assessed whether uh, the legal provisions and the underlying policy is still fit for purpose or whether there is uh, there are needs for, for adjustments of, of, of the legal framework. And I will, I will speak uh, about it a little bit later in my presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so um, what, uh, what has been achieved so far is, is that the, the, uh, on, the, on the basis of, of the cross-border healthcare directive, uh, we uh, actually uh, supported uh, the establishment of uh, individual uh, networks in 24 uh, different areas, specializing in, in different uh, rare conditions. This is just a list just for your information of the, uh, of the existing 24 uh, European reference networks. Um, the uh, ERN lung, uh, the animal rare respiratory diseases, including Alpha one was uh, was mentioned mentioned already, so I just want to highlight this one. But I mean, we uh, as as you see, currently we have twenty four um, uh, networks. Uh, next slide, please. And on 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 this slide, uh, uh, I just try to summarize the main uh, achievements and the main areas of activities of uh, of the network so far. So as I said, uh, the networks were uh, set, uh, set up in two thousand seventeen. Currently, we have uh, more than 900 uh, highly specialized healthcare units being part of, uh, of the system, uh, coming from more than 300 hospitals all over uh, Europe. Um, and uh, we are also currently undergoing a, a process of, of um, geographical enlargement of, of, of the networks. So there was a, a call for new, um, uh, for new uh, members to join the existing uh, networks uh, published uh, recently. And, and currently we are uh, assessing the applications for these, these mem uh, new members. And we expect uh, the system to almost double, uh, double in size. Um, so, so far uh, we have managed to, to uh, have a clear legal basis in, in, in place. The 24 networks started their uh, clinical work. We have a strong political support at, at the uh, EU level, and, and the errands are really perceived as a, as a very good example of European cooperation. And what is very specific and unique about the project is that um, is, is the joint ownership. So uh, uh, there is a, really a combination of different stakeholders that are making an effort in the same direction. So. Uh, Obviously, member states, authorities, I mean, need to be supportive of, uh, of the initiatives uh, of, of the ERNs. But uh, we have also um, strong involvement of patient uh, representatives, for example, in the governance of each network. Uh, there is a, a, a representative of patient organization. Um, clearly, the whole, whole project is, is driven by health professionals and their, their enthusiasm and their initiative to, to, to network and work together across borders. Uh, we also have a strong support from, from the hospital managers and healthcare providers, and obviously also, also the EU institutions, um, in particular the European Commission and also the European Parliament. Um, we have um, secured uh, uh, funding from the available EU um, instruments. So just recently, uh, in at the end of March, uh, the the new EU for Health uh, program was uh, adopted, uh, which provides a financial framework for uh, the period from 2021 until 2027, so a multi-annual um, framework. And the European uh, reference networks are mentioned as one of the specific objectives to be supported uh, from, from this program. Um, so uh, there is uh, funding available for the coordination of the activities at the European level. This does not mean that this funding is sufficient because we also need the member states, I mean, to, to play uh, their part in, uh, in the project and, and support uh, the healthcare providers and, and professionals at the national level. And we have a consolidated governance uh, and uh, solid uh, networking uh, structure uh, in place. 
with regard to the specific um, actions I mentioned already, in most of them, so clinical cooperation on patient cases via the, um, the telemedicine tools, knowledge generation, in particular, you know, in the area of training, education, and awareness actions, uh, development and implementation of clinical practice guidelines. Um, the networks are, are already uh, publishing, you know, in, in a, an important number of, of scientific publications. They are uh, engaged in, in various research projects, and uh, we are supporting also development of uh, patient registries for, for um, each network that should in the future become part of the future Euro European health data space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think we can go to the next slide because this is just more details about the enlargement. This is a snapshot from, from our website where you see, I mean, the geographical coverage. Uh, of the European Defense Networks and, and uh, almost uh, the whole uh, area of European Union is already covered by either the full ER members or at least affiliated partners. The next slide, please. So um, with regard to the, to the next steps, um, I think, uh, and I, I try to structure them in five main, main, main areas, so, 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 so very briefly. One um, upcoming challenge is, is to manage the, uh, the current enlargement of the geographical scope uh, of, of, of the network. So we need to complete the um, ongoing enlargement and we need to consolidate the whole system and ensure long-term sustainability, both financially. So I mentioned already the EU4 Health Programme, which is an important instrument, uh, but we will also need member states engagement and also uh, the organizational um, structure of, of the networks because uh, this will be quite quite challenging, especially on, on the coordinating centers now, uh, if, if the networks uh, substantially um, uh, increase in, in, in their size. Next slide, please. Um, so the other area of, uh, of uh, action is the integration of the European Defense Networks into the national healthcare systems. Um, the, uh, it, is, it is very important that the activities taking place at the European level and the, 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 the cooperation at the European level are then transformed uh, also to the national level and that there is a clear, uh, uh, there are clear pathways and, and clear referral procedures for, for patients you know, at, the, at, at, the, at the regional or local level and their health professionals that they are aware of what the ERNs can offer and that they, uh, there is a clear uh, you know, system for referring patients so that uh, they can uh, benefit from the activities of, of the ERNs as much as, as possible. And uh, we intend to support um, the efforts of, of the member states in this area by um, a joint action, so, so by providing funding. Uh, possibly not for 2021, I mean, uh, there is a you know, question mark, but uh, it's, it's more likely to be uh, in 2022, but uh, it's an important uh, area we need to focus on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the third area uh, clearly is, is the knowledge generation, and that's uh, that's where the, the European Defence Networks can play a very important role. So we are supporting the networks in development um, of the clinical practice guidelines. We plan to set up um, in in the near future uh, the ERN Virtual Academy, so a platform for uh, online trainings for um, health professionals uh, dealing with rare diseases, but also, for example, for patient or patient representatives. Um, we are organizing a professional mobility program uh, so that uh, the health professionals can, uh, you know, uh, spend some time in another specialized center within the same network and, and learn uh, from, from their colleagues in the other center. And uh, the networks are also preparing their training and education strategy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, obviously, research uh, on, on rare diseases is, is, is a very important area where uh, ERNs can uh, provide significant added value. So as I mentioned, we are supporting all 24 uh, networks in a setup of, of uh, their patient registries. And we need to make sure that these registries are linked to the future European uh, data space. And um, next slide, please. Uh, last, but certainly not, not least, uh, we also um, need to demonstrate, uh, start demonstrating the added value of, of the ERNs. Um, they were established, you know, four years ago in 2017 but now we are coming to the stage where we need, we need to evaluate you know how they how they work and and, and perhaps uh, make some some proposals or recommendations for for future improvements so there are two important um uh, initiatives ongoing i mean the, the first one is the evaluation of the cross-border healthcare directive which i mentioned previously 
which is uh, an evaluation of the general policy and, and the legal, legal framework that should be completed uh, next year. And where uh, in, uh, in involvement and contribution from all the stakeholders uh, will be very important. So I just would like to encourage you to, uh, to contribute to this. For example, we are planning to launch an open public consultation uh, in, in May, so next, next month, that will be published on our uh, website. And uh, a very specific part of the consultation will also deal with the issues related to the European Defense Networks and rare diseases. So um, you may wish to contribute to that consultation um, in that context. And uh, uh, another important initiative is the first periodic five-year assessment of the performance of the networks on, and, and their members that uh, will start you know, five years after uh, their establishment in 2022. And we expect to have the final report uh, available in 2023. Uh, next slide, please. And I, I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. So just, I mean, uh, to provide a little bit more details on the ongoing evaluation that I just mentioned. I mean, here are some questions, some evaluation questions that we are trying to answer, uh, you know, as part of this evaluation of the cross-border healthcare directive. So how effective is the directive in supporting the diagnosis and treatment of patients with rare and complex diseases through the European Defense Networks? How effective is the knowledge sharing uh, among the healthcare professionals, uh, thanks to the ERNs? Uh, what has been the impact on ERNs on, on research on rare and low prevalence and complex diseases? Um, uh, whether uh, the, uh, uh, the ERNs as set out in, in the directive are still relevant for, for meeting the needs of patients with rare and complex diseases, or in what ways the ERNs established by the directive provide an added value for patients in comparison uh, to purely national, national solutions. So, so this is what the evaluation will try to establish and on that, that this will help us uh, then to, to uh, conclude uh, you know, what actions to take in the future and how to, how to adjust the, the current system. With that, I will, I will uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention and uh, I wish you good luck for the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. De Rosio. And now we will move into the open floor discussion. I think we still have um, a couple of minutes to address some of the questions which were tabled. If you do think um, about additional questions, please make sure to type them either in the chat or the Q&A box. So the first question I have here is uh, to Professor Horostovska. To what extent the ERN lung and other EU-based structures involve patients, patient organizations, to identify and solve their unmet need? Well, as I mentioned, patients are an important part of the of the of the network. Patients are uh, members of the of the core groups. Patients are also involved in the leadership within the groups. So, I do believe that the patient's voice is very strong within the ERN lung, and this is a. a, a very important and I would say very um, fundamental um, fundamental issue. Uh, however, uh, I think it was hopefully clearly clear from my presentation, but also Mr. Dolazil shown you have shown the the map, the latest map uh, following the latest call for uh, new members of ERN networks. And I, if you look at the map it's pretty clear that there are regions within Europe of unmet, unmet needs. So density of centers is definitely uh, more to the uh, central Western Europe. And then if you look eastwards and westwards, uh, it, the density is uh, not as uh, uh, good as we would like to have it. And I think that speaks for the unmet need uh, of the patients, first of all, unmet need of diagnostics and clinical care. And also if one looks at the numbers of diagnosed patients in, let's say my region, Central East, clear that um, we definitely uh, are not as efficient as we should be in terms of providing diagnostic and clinical service to the potential patients because many of them have not been diagnosed. And secondly, um, it also speaks for the fact that the, the potential expert uh, centers, the centers that could potentially develop into the centers with the highest expertise need probably uh, some help either from the network uh, or from the EU or from the local uh, governments. This is 
for me a very open question, probably a very individual question. Nevertheless, we definitely should consider some kind, some kind of uh, support or stimuli that would really prompt development of, um, of uh, uh, supporting centers, collaborating centers that, that would become an expert centers in those regions, regions of unmet need. And I think that very, very well links the patient's needs and but also the, the potential, very high potential I do see within the ERM uh, networks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Horostowska. Um, the next question I have here on the list is uh, to Professor McAlvaney. It is from uh, Frank Willison from Alpha One Plus. Is there any research going on to densify lung tissue and to bring a lung with emphysema back to a normal lung. What is your perspective on that? It is a really interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, the lung is a very fragile organ. So it doesn't heal well when uh, faced with a, uh, an inflammation. So it heals by scarring, basically. So unfortunately, we have looked at attempts to see if could we regrow lung or re, uh, revitalize lung. And all the attempts to date have been, unfortunately, ineffective. There's no evidence that we can regrow normal lung. So that's one of the problems with emphysema. Once you've got it, it's very hard to, it's impossible at the moment to reg regress it. You can either stop it progressing, but actually restoring the lung to normal is basically impossible with what we have at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McAvaney. The next question is uh, again from Frank to Professor Horostowska. Um, so he, so uh, Frank writes, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a rare condition treated by augmentation therapy in only 17 out of 47 European countries. Do you think ERN lung and ERCO activities like your cross-border health care initiative will flatten these conditions so alphas can get augmentation therapy more easily in a, neighbor, in a neighboring country in the next 10 years? Well, this is uh, what I call a tricky question. Uh, I, I would love to say yes. Uh, so, of course, uh, the access to treatment very much depends on the uh, local policy of the of the government, uh, of the pol reimbursement policy. This is not uh, uh, up to your and lung, neither to uh, um, clinical research network. However, we could also um, play an important part in changing the situation by, for example, uh, making sure that diagnostic is accessible in those countries. So we are able to, we would be able to diagnose patients, we would be able to provide them with the accessible clinical care with the expertise, and then hopefully uh, this would prompt the, uh, the um, regulators, the local national regulators to consider um, reimbursement for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for accessible, for, uh, for existing treatment. And it, it is, in my uh, opinion, important also because I think that would provide the ideal setting for this highly specialized treatment. So we would actually create an environment, highly specialized the medical clinical environment for uh, providing the highly specialized treatment. I think that that would be the optimal uh, setup. Um, therefore, yes, the answer is yes, but conditionally. Thank you very much, Professor Horostowska. And we have one more question to you. Uh, to what extent, how do disparities in access to specialized care affect of one antitrypsin deficiency patients? Well, uh, they, they definitely do. And I can speak for that. Uh, being part of the Central Eastern European Alpha One Network, uh, um, significant number of countries in my region do not uh, have uh, access to uh, neither treatment uh, that includes Poland, um, but also uh, to uh, diagnostics. And uh, in that regard, it, disparities definitely, definitely uh, affect patients in a more, uh, in, in many possible um, ways. Um, in terms of, uh, but also in terms, I think, in terms of uh, education and social awareness, public awareness of the disease uh, that also is affected uh, by the disparities. So um, in conclusion, there is much to be done 
and there's much to be done both by uh, by European Union healthcare professionals, but also patient organization. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Horostowska. And I think we I think we have only one more question, but I don't think we have time to respond to it now. So this will be responded to in the in the subsequent report from the event. And now it's it's time to to move to, to the conclusion uh, to the conclusion of the open floor. I wanted to thank everyone who participated in the Q and A session, and especially our esteemed speakers. And now I just want to pass the floor to Ms. Vizere Lima and Ms. Matias for the concluding remarks. Uh, perhaps Ms. Vizere Lima first. First of all, I really want. Uh... First of all, I really want to thank all the panelists for this really uh, high level contributions. It was very interesting to, to listen to you. From a political point of view, I was really um, very convinced that what uh, Martin Dorazil to told us, I, I hope I said the name correctly, uh, told us. And um, I think it's very promising, pr promising what, what all the analyses that that are done um, and and the way we want to go i think this can really help patients uh, now what is really important is the implementation often that's the problem and uh, i had written member states right two seconds before uh, mr martin de Razil named the, the, the member states. So I really think that it has to be done at all levels. I will stop here. Thank you very, very much. It was very interesting. And I'm very, um, yes, confident when I see how many uh, energy all of you put into this. I'm, I'm confident. Thank you very, very much. Thank you also from my side. I, I want to, to thank all the presentations to say it was really interesting and, and I learned, I've learned a lot. Uh, and uh, of course, it just reinforced our intentions to support, to back uh, your demands and uh, the ways you are trying to improve people's lives in such a way like you have presented. I, I, I want to, to say also that it's quite clear uh, after this uh, seminar that uh, we really need to engage and to involve um, patients and experts uh, and those who are used to, to get involved with the patients through the research and through the clinical methods. So again, uh, I want to thank you all very, very much. And uh, I would uh, just say that, uh, yeah, it's quite promising what was presented by the commission uh, side. Uh, I think that we are moving uh, forward. Uh, but again, uh, I think it will be uh, even better if uh, patients and experts are engaged and involved in all the phases uh, not only in the implementation, but also in the design, in the conception, in the way things are defined in order to be implemented after. Um, so thank you so much again, all of you, and uh, we'll keep in touch for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very and much. with this, we conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>